So I'm Jeff Sweeney. Uh, I've been working with Inflow and CATI coming up on 14 years now. I've been doing uh, PDM implementations and, and support and helping people uh, get through different types of things. This presentation that I'm going to show you is the one that I did at 3D Experience World back uh, earlier in the month. And uh, kind of the way I like to do these is, is I'll, the slideshow is really mostly, at least for, for people at 3D Experience World, I don't know if you've ever been there, but uh, people like to take pictures of the slide. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate the software, show you the concepts and the actual live software itself. Then we'll jump back over to PowerPoint and we can use that kind of as a review of that topic that we just saw. Plus, if you'd like, you certainly are, uh, can uh, take some screenshots right then and there if you want. I also noticed this is going to be recorded. So uh, later on, if you're interested in getting the full recording, you're welcome to do so as well. So th this presentation is, is kind of aimed for basic type of users. We're going to talk about uh, these three different topics. I want to just show you the new search stuff. So these, the search section is going to be really for talking about what's new in PDM 2020, because there's a lot of neat little things with, with the searches as well. As you, you'll see here in this list, nearly everything in this list is pertaining to PDM professional. Uh, though there, there are some things in here, especially the Explorer stuff, everything I'll show you there will work for both PDM Pro and, and Standard. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the search tool. Uh, next, I want to show you the report generator, which is a, is a pro-only tool. It gives you the ability to uh, quickly see information about the files themselves. And then um, we're also going to get into the command line search as well. I'll show you a, just a little fun little application that I wrote that uh, a lot of people kind of like. So we'll show that off as well. So what I'm going to show you here is just a demo of the new search box in 2020. And uh, I guess there's not really an end. We'll just go ahead and show you that toolbox. Let me move this guy out of the way. So new in 2020, up here in the top right hand corner, we have the ability to, uh, to, to search without bringing up a data card, which I definitely love to show off. Another nice thing is, is that if you're big in keyboard shortcuts, you can really um, use that very quickly. So I can, just the control F takes you right up there to the very top. And uh, you notice that I can do a search right now without even having to search, uh, open up a data card. So I, I really like the ability to do that. Um, gives you it find things very quickly. So you see here, I just typed in bracket, and I got several different types of hits with bracket, as you might would might accept, expect. Um, just clear the search and takes you right back to the regular system here. And and you notice it also keeps track of the last groups of searches that you've done here. So you see, I, I was playing with some searches. We'll do here in a couple of minutes. I can clear that out as, as well. Now, what's it searching on? If I use this search, well, by default, it's going to search on just file name. But you, as the administrator, you do have the ability, if you choose, to give it the ability to search more things. And let me show you where that list is. If you go to the administration tool, and then under, oops, under list, there's a new option here under PDM uh, Pro and Standard, a quick search variable list. And I can come into here, create several different types of lists, because maybe different people in your organization would want to search for different types of things. In this example here, you see that I've added the, the description and the material. So now anything that I type in there is not only going to search for file names, it's going to also search through all the file descriptions and all the files materials. And then over here on the right-hand side, I can choose now who would be able to use this type of search. Maybe you, one of your search things would be something top secret, and not everybody can search, so that's why you might want to give different types of searches for each one. Now, they do caution you, they, the longer this list, the less snappier your searches are going to be. So certainly you could add many, many variables down through here, but if you think about it, the more variables you have that there's a search on, that is one more field that you need to search through the database. So you kind of need to weigh all back and forth between the performance versus uh, usability with your users. So certainly you want to think about the most common variables that your users might want to search on, because I, I, as you can see, being able to use this tool is, going to, is much better than using search cards. I, it's going to be a lot quicker for your users to be able to navigate through the system. The, um, now we also do support some new types of, of searches as well, some additional type things. So if I do uh, Jeff space Sweeney, that is going to go out and find every file that matches exactly Jeff Sweeney. So in the past, back before 2020, that space would have treated like an or. 
And um, so you know, it would have found everything that contained Jeff or contained Sweeney, but now it doesn't no longer behave that way. If I want to do an or, I actually need to add the word or inside the search. So now it's going to find everything that contains either Jeff or Sweeney. Um, you can also use, if you're a, a, a programmer, you might recognize this, the pipe. The pipe also works as an OR. And so in this case, it will give you the same result. It doesn't really matter which way you want to go. You can also do an AND search. And so uh, this would find everything that contains either Jeff and Sweeney. So it gives you, it gives you both. Now, it wouldn't have to be Jeff Sweeney. You could find Sweeney Jeff as well. It doesn't matter. But it needs to have both of those hits there. Uh, the, the shortcut to AND is the ampersand. So you're welcome to, to use either one of those guys, whatever you want. But we also do not now, which we didn't have before. So if I want to find everything that was uh, Jeff but not Sweeney, this would find uh, should find uh, Jeff Bridges in that, in that example there. And the shortcut to not is an exclamation point. And you know, I found it, it doesn't say this anywhere in the instructions, but I found that if you do an exclamation point, it seems to behave a little bit better. So uh, to put the exclamation point in front of it gives you the ability to build that up. So quick way, a bunch of ways that, that you can sort different types of things. Um, some other new additions that they've added in our search card, we still have support cards, right? Over here on the right-hand side, we can have get to our searches as we might need to. And they've added in the search card a new type of uh, new ability inside the search card itself. And so what you can do is you can click on a, a, a text box, and you'll notice there's an option up here for multivariable. And so that's what I've done here. In, in the multivariable, I'm saying, hey, um, imagine you have a data card and your users have been able to put some things in description one, description two, or description three, several different types of places. And then, uh, which really looks good on a data card, but back in the past, that always made things hard to search because, well, I don't know where he entered this particular word. And did he enter it in description one or he entered in description uh, two? This now, anything that I entered here into this, my complete search now will search in both description one, description two, and actually it's not description one, description two, three, and regular. So again, just like before, you do want to kind of limit that. You don't want to have a, all your variables in there because it does take a little bit more time searching. But certainly uh, opportunities like this are huge to be able to search within your data cards if you're not exactly sure where that information might be. You can also do number searches too. Let me, let's switch back to the complete search. Search on a card. So maybe I want to search for a particular number. So maybe I'll find everything where the mass is greater than five. So we support greater than, less than, uh, greater than, and equal to, and not greater than, that kind of thing, too. So we have the ability to build that up. Now, why did I get a hit? Oh, because I'm too high up my tree here. Let's get rid of that folder there. Now back to my card. So now I should find everything greater than five. There we go. So these are the, the uh, and my data card should give me some hits. Yep, to build that up. So we can do number searches too. Now, of course, be careful for if you want to do number type searches, that it does kind of depend on how you define that variable in the first place. So when you define the variable, in this case, I define math as a as a uh, number value, that means it's going to be able to sort properly. If I made it text, you can support greater than, less than, equal to with text type variables as well. But recall that sometimes you're going to get weird type things, right? Because if you sort alphabetically, you'll get things different than if you support them numerically. A good example of that would be um, the number 10, right? Is a one zero. And alphabetically, that comes before five, right? Because one becomes before five, so that would give you a hit there. Versus uh, if it's a number, certainly 10 would come after five. So be, be kind of aware of that, uh, of, of each one of those guys as might need to. So let's, uh, let's jump back over to my PowerPoint. These are the words. So again, we can uh, support with the OR, with the pipe, or the actually write out the word. Oh, oh, by the way, it does have to be capital. You can't do like the lowercase OR. It does have to be capital OR. Same thing for the capital AND. It has to be AND, or these AND symbols. And these are the different types of numeric searches that we support as well. And, and uh, you notice, what I was talking about here is when you define the variable itself, you might get different types of searches if you have a text file versus if you choose a, a decimal integer or an integer uh, number. The neat thing is, I've been playing with this, is if you have 
um, just kept it as text over time. And, and uh, you do have the ability, you could change it to an integer number right now. Uh, it, PDM does allow you to change the variable type on an existing system. And what, what it will do then is that if it can, say I, I change it to a, a decimal number, if it can, it will actually convert to a decimal number. So all those values will go in to be treated like that. But if you did happen to have something in value for weight where the guy typed in uh, maybe 10 pounds, well, 10 pounds with that word, because I've added the word pounds on there, that can't be treated like a, a decimal anymore because it contains the text as well. So then PDM will just continue to treat that as text. So I guess again, if it can treat it like a number, it will if you change it, but obviously if it can't, it will continue to treat it like it normally has. So kind of be aware of that because of the, the fact that they've added these in here, you might want to reconsider some of your variables and investigate if you're interested in uh, dialing those up. Um, so again, double quotes don't work the same way. In, in, in the past, if I wanted to search for Jeff Sweeney, I would have to put that inside a quote. Uh, now just type it out, it will support a space just as any other character as you wanted to. Um, and because of the fact that now quotes are treated differently, if you do actually need to search on a quote, you do need, do need to add an escape character. So if I want to search for three-inch pipe, you need a three-slash-inch symbol to give you the pipe. That's the only way you can search for a double quote now is actually to add an escape character in there. Notice there at the very bottom, I kind of mentioned that if you um, have had some saved searches in the past then uh, and you've built those, those up, when you upgrade to 2020, PDM does a real nice job, and it does convert all the searches to be treated like a, uh, for a 2020 version, so you don't have to do anything special in your saved searches. Oh, things that haven't changed. Um, we still do support the asterisk. So C star T would find cat, coat, Connecticut. Um, but if you do a question mark instead, you would only find a cat, but you wouldn't find coat. So we do still support the single characters as a question mark, or the, the asterisk is good. So that hasn't changed at all. So let's, let's talk about the, uh, the, the complete search, the big search now, because they have also in 2020, I didn't put this out, let's jump over here. You notice that we do have the ability to save the searches out. So after I get a, a search, I can uh, export my searches out to, a, to another system. Um, so what good is the complete search? Well, the complete search does still have a little bit of value with the search tool, I'm sorry. You notice the search tool itself brings up a separate program. Um, this gives you the ability to, to save your searches, to, uh, to build things up. So you know, why would I ever use this tool anymore? Because everything is now in, in the regular Internet Explorer. Now that's not 100% true. We do have the ability to search across different vaults. And so maybe I had some data in different vaults. So I want to be able to search for those. I just had a check mark here. And it'll actually search in both vaults at the same time. So that's kind of nice. This is also the only place where you can edit your favorites. So if you have them been saving some favorites or somebody shared a favorite with you that you no longer need, you can come into here and uh, get rid of those uh, searches if you ever need to. So you give the ability to do that. I also like to use this tool if ever I'm using big search results. So let's do, imagine I'm doing a search that's returning several thousand files. Um, inside of Windows Explorer, that search can be sometimes kind of slow. Um, inside of this, it's a lot faster because I don't have the, the overhead of Windows Explorer. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit quicker. So certainly, if I had a bunch of files here, and in this case, score is kind of silly, right? But if I wanted to check them all out, check them all in, and, and I wanted to do a bunch of files at the same time, I would use this tool here because selecting the documents and working with them is much, much nicer. So um, let's, let's talk about the report generator and uh, when, we, when we use that. So how do I create a report? I'll show you a little a couple of examples of some simple reports, I'll show you kind of what some of the things it can do, and then how to export them out as well. So how do you get to the report generator? Let's this guy, switch back to which one to explore. The report generator is under tools, report generator. Again, this is a PDM Pro only. So what you're seeing here is uh, the top left-hand corner, this section here, the listing of all the reports that I've currently been able to run in the past. And so maybe I want to find all duplicate file names in my vault. I can just add a check mark here and hit the run button, and it's going to give me that report down to the very bottom. If I want to export these results out, I do have the ability to print them here or export them out of the common delimited. Actually, it's a, uh, yeah, as a common delimited file, 
in which case then you can you know, push it to Excel if you want to do, or you can print directly from here. So this is kind of a nice thing to be able to do this. So in short, just highlight whatever you, you uh, want to run and build those up and, and, and then run it here at the top. Um, here's, here, let's, let's show you what that looks like. Let's build uh, this to show you this mass reports. Maybe I want to find a, a simple little report showing me the total mass of all my files in the vault. So here's my reports. To, uh, to, to get a report to make a brand new report out, in fact, you do need a couple different parts to it. Up, up there at the very top, the, this is the name of the report itself. This value here under name, that is the value that will show up in your report tool itself. So the mass of all files in the vault came from right here. This is really not used for um, very much, if, especially if you're going to just use it for your own, if you ever thought you were going to sell reports, perhaps, you might have some values here. The description it will appear when you hover over the report. That will, will show up here. In the version, the, this is, is if you ever change the, your report and want PDM to reload it in, you do need to bump the version. So if I ever say try to import a, a, a say I make a change to my query down here at the very bottom, and I want PDM to bring that report back in again, if it recognizes that the version is the same, the tool is going to go well. They go, you already brought this in, and it won't bring the new version in. So all you need to do is just bump this, make this number a little bit bigger than it was before, and then that's all. All the PDM needs to recognize. Oh, there's something different here, and it'll reload that that report in if you ever need to. Arguments. So right now, you notice there aren't any arguments. And so what that means is, that if you remember, when I ran this report and hit go, it just went ahead and went out and found the results for me. We do have the ability to do some arguments, and we'll talk about here in some other reports. And I think the arguments are really kind of where uh, we can get kind of clever with some of these reports, where I can uh, generate one report that can maybe give me many different kinds of results, depending on what we're looking for here. The regular old, uh, this, this flag here tells the report generator that everything coming after that inside of the, the, the square bracket is going to be actual a, a SQL report, or the actual SQL itself. So this is native SQL query language. So uh, if you don't know a whole lot about SQL and, and you think reports are going to be pretty slow, there's lots of resources out there, um, some great resources as far as uh, SQL reporting goes, creating reports. What I'd like for you to go to the knowledge base and, and say, hey, is there a report for X? In many cases, there's a report out there for you already. So you can maybe take that SQL report, or SQL query, and build up your own reports from there. And certainly, uh, you can take some time. We're not going to get into teaching you SQL today, but there's lots of resources out there that you want to be able to run with. So in this case here, it just basically says, hey, I want you to uh, calculate the variable to bring it up as a total weight, and it's just going through applying it every time that we have a, the, a variable called mass, and it's going to add that up. And I'll run this one more time so you can see how this program ran. And it's, it's really pretty fast. But we, we can have uh, arguments as well. So let's show you the next option here. So let's say that I want to know within a particular folder. I'll, just, I'll open that, this guy up. Pretty much the same query as you saw before, but you notice what I have different here is I say that, hey, I want to be able to uh, ask the user what folder do I want to want to work in. And so it's going to go ahead and figure out what the project ID is. And then the only real difference is, you notice there under my where clause, I've added an additional filter where I'm taking the value of that project ID. So let's show you what this looks like. Massive folder argument. Let's go to my report generator and let's open up that new report that I need to show you. Next question to ask me is, okay, who's going to be allowed to run this report? Because maybe you don't want your reports being available to everybody. So that's an important point here. Is these these queries and everything, uh, your report generator does not go through and filter files based off of right. So let's imagine you have some files that in PDM users can't see um, because maybe the files are in a folder they can't see, or maybe the files are in a workflow statement they can't see. The report generator just says, hey, you asked for the files, you're going to get them. So this is how you go through and decide and, and build report, make sure that you can hide files from users, just can hide the entire report from users, right? So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and be, I'm logged into the admin, so I'm going to give this to the admin user. And now we have an additional query that's been added. So 
Um, that last section there, that's how you handle the security. You certainly could go through and add security in with your query over here because you do have the ability to find the current user and find out what they're doing, but then that makes your queries a lot more difficult. So let's run this new one here, which is asking for an argument. Go ahead and hit run. And then you notice that it does have a nice little dialog box where my users can then pick and say, I want to search only inside of this particular folder here. So now when I do a search, in this case, it shouldn't give me any hit. I don't think I have anything in my project folder. Yep. So now it found the mass of all the files in that particular folder. So you can add a, a command line there. You can um, also ask for other types of questions too. So maybe I want to do a user history. So I can click this guy, let's turn this one off and hit run. So this is an example of another type of argument where I can ask the user to, to, and PDM will say, give me a list of all the current users, all the current workflow states. There's a lot of different types of uh, dialog boxes here that you can use to get input from your uh, users to uh, quickly make a nice, nice report as you might need to. So I'll show you another example here. Let's bring in uh, three class with file arguments. So this one works a little bit differently. You notice this M here, and I'm not sure what the M stands for, but what the M basically means is that it's going to be smart that the report generator is going to use this as your input. And so let's imagine that, let's bring this in, I'm going to open this up, uh, import massive file argument, it has that M, same question, if we're going to use this guy. And then I want it to give me the mass of all the files that's in this little, little section here. So I could drag and drop files one at a time. So if I want to have that tell me what the mass of the battery is, let's do that. In this case now, it's good if I run the, the mass of the, of the chosen file, hit run. I don't want that, so let's turn that off. Yep, that was 10. Here you can do entire folders too if you want. So let's take this purchase folder, which contains some subfolders in here. It doesn't bring the folders over, but it brings all the files in that folder. So now if I run that, that query, it's going to go ahead and say, all right, and it adds up all three of those. So we can't add, ever add folders into this list here, but we can add different files. If teacher uses to drag and drop files into the section, and then it will run the query based off of those particular sections. So this is pretty neat. And the last one I'm not going to show you, but the, I, I was talking about how we could do different types of uh, users or branches. So let's go back to my report examples. Get my status. And this is just an example where I, I can ask the user. Maybe, you know, what is the actual status itself? So that gives the user a drop list, and the user can pick from a list of a bunch of uh, workflow states. So lots of neat little arguments, lots of ways we can do this, and we can export those out. Here's just kind of an example of some of the predefined argument types. So um, you know, I can ask it, what have PDM ask the user, what, uh, what's the workflow state? That's one you just saw a second ago. Maybe I can ask them to select a, a group. It's just basically a string where I'm going to ask the user, hey, type in a value, and you're going to run your query off of that particular search. Maybe now you ask select the folder. That's the that second dialogue, second query you saw me do. Ask the pro, select a particular user. Get a bunch of users from each one of those guys, or select a plot. So if you put an N after each one of those guys, that was going to ask a single value uh, versus the M on the right end. That the M tells it, hey, we're going to use that little input dialog box on the right hand side. And the S just basically depends on uh, if we're going to bring things from a list. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on here, but some kind of neat examples uh, you might need to see here is uh, how, how, what, the, what the current value is. We're going to accept one particular point. And then here's, we're going to, for the string, we're going to ask the user to type in the start date, and that value is going to go into the variable start date. Lots of different ways we can do this. I'm not going to spend more time on it. Resources, here's the, this is probably the best one right here. If you go into your computer that has PDM installed on it, go to that installation folder where you install PDM, and in there you're going to find a report examples.crp file. This is uh, gold. It's got a whole bunch of examples in there, and that's pretty much how I learned how to do this. I went through those and, and, and copied them into my own text file and built them up and changed them however I want. The administration guide certainly has some good resources in it as well. 
And so I uh, definitely would uh, encourage you guys to look in there as well. All right, indexing. This was one that I want to clean up a little bit. So in my complete search, I have a content search on the very end. And most of you guys probably do too if you're using the basic one. But a lot of people don't even know what this is. What is the content search itself? So maybe I want to find everything that has 3DX 2020 inside of it. I'm going to do a search for find the for files. But you notice, if I click on this file, look at this data card, the, that string is not anywhere. It's not, not in that name. It's not in the name of any of these guys. Uh, so how does it find the file if that information wasn't in any of these file data cards? And the way it did is, is when, I, when a content search actually looks inside of the files themselves. It doesn't have to search for it, any of the properties, right? So any of these tabs here, from here over to the history, we're looking at properties, things that you either entered in to a file card or you typed in the information that goes specifically for searching. But sometimes you might have a bunch of old legacy data where information came in that nobody filled in data card for. Or you're looking for maybe a particular uh, note in a, in, a, in a drawing, different types of things for it. This guy looks inside the file. So look at this text file here. If I look at the preview of it, here's that word. It's inside the actual text document itself. Same thing for a DWG file. This is going through and it's just a DWG that has a block with that particular attribute. It works for a Word document. Excel documents, and here's what I love. We can even do TIFFs and bitmaps. So it, there's even some object character recognition going on in here where you can actually look inside the files themselves. The uh, the SolidWorks drawing files. So earlier I mentioned the ability to search for, I'm looking for a drawing that has a particular note. You can find this kind of thing. So you can search inside a PDF file as well. The uh, email attachment. So uh, drag and drop the email attachment in here. Well, look, this email doesn't have that word inside of it. But it has an attachment. Let's look at the attachment. Yep. So inside my attachment, we have that there. So if you drag and drop your emails into your vault, we can actually search inside of your email attachment. The next one's a little bit simpler. It's just simple uh, text files that says uh, right there. So we can be able to build a lot of different types of things to it. How does all this work? Let's show you. On your archive server, there we go, indexing options. That's right, since we're indexing. So this is the magic behind the tool. And what this is, is kind of like a, a, a Google crawler, um, right? So, so what, you know, you think about what a search engine does. It, it's constantly looking for new documents. And if it finds a new document, it scans through that document, and it, what we call it indexes it up. And that's what we're doing here, is we're indexing my vault. And so the first section here is where I choose what, what folders do I want to, uh, to index. And this is a, I'm navig I've navigated into my actual location where the, my, my 16 folders are located. So that's all that works. Where the heck is my bullet now? No, trust me. Here, I'll, <laughs> just you add check marks next to folders that you want. PDM to search. And one of the searches is going to search is actually the vault itself, the 16 folders. Not a vault view, but the actual vault itself. After you've done that, then you certainly can come into the advanced section, uh, tell Pete, tell the indexing where you want to search this guy. And kind of be aware, this search can get kind of big. And so that's something that, that uh, why lots of times people won't turn on the search, is that depending on the kind of data that you're uh, going to index, the index can be almost as big as the vault itself. But it's hard to so, so, but how do you estimate? Well, it, it's not really an easy way to estimate because it depends on the files, right? If, if you have a bunch of files that can't be indexed, well, they won't be indexed, so they won't be included in there. A uh, good example, a big, huge SOLIDWORKS uh, part file. Well, there's not much text in there, so that part file itself is going to be a lot bigger. The file itself is going to be a lot bigger, but the, um, the actual indexing the part of that would be little. Versus a text file, well, a text file can be almost purely indexed, so that's almost a one-to-one. -one. So I guess the quick answer is how do you estimate how big this is going to get is it kind of depends on what your percentage of files are that contain text versus not. And um, that's really the best you can really do. I usually just recommend just trying it, keep an eye on your disk space, and, and get an idea of how big you're going to need to. Something important to kind of pay attention to is the file type itself. So from here, 
here's where we can tell uh, the indexing what kind of files you wanted to index. So if I didn't want it to include any uh, SLN folders, uh, now they will not be included into my index. When you click on a particular file, I can also decide what you want me to index. So this is kind of a basic properties only. And if you can tell I'm using this, using this for your vault, this probably doesn't have a whole, whole lot of value to you just because of the, of the reason that they we're already putting most of your properties in your data card anyway. Pick this guy here, and it's gonna look at the properties and the actual file contents itself. So if you find your SOLIDWORKS files, very often you're going to want to include this guy so you can quickly pick each one of those guys up. You'll notice up here at the top, this is actually hot, and this will, uh, will keep things up to date. So kind of keep an eye on this to see how things are going. Uh, the first time you turn on the index unit, it might take several hours because it's going through every single file one at a time. And then this guy will just sit in the background waiting, and as new files are added to the vault, you'll see this guy starts running again and, and updating from each one of those guys. And it's pretty smart, too. If, it, if, it, if the indexing tool recognizes that, hey, uh, my computer is really beaten up because uh, there's a whole lot of other type of activity going on my computer, this will pause and just wait until maybe to, at the night time. Oh, and I got a little system. Your CPU tickets, ticks that I can use, and we'll go ahead and start building that kind of um, rebuilding the index there. So it only indexes when you want. So because of that, you have to understand that if you just drag and drop a bunch of files into your vault, they might not be indexed right away. They, they might take you know, hours or even days, depending on how much files you just added in there, before the index will work. So it's not immediate, but it is usually uh, pretty quick, kind of depends on how things work. So after you've gone through and built the index itself and where you put the index, the next step to the whole story is in your administration tool. We need to tell PDM that you have turned on an index. So under indexing, you need to log into the server. And it sounds really pretty easy. The, um, this setting right here, okay, yep, here is where my actual archive files are themselves. And here is the location of where I put that index. Click that checkbox, and then, you know, assuming that everything's ready to go, then that content search is going to start working for you. There's two options down here at the very bottom. Um, you're hardly ever going to use this indexing service. Microsoft the trick it, quit using it back in uh, Windows. Seven. So um, any modern server is not going to have this option at all. So for the most part, you're going to choose the Windows search. So just so if you want to get a screenshot of this guy, you come in here, hit the Modify button to add additional folders into your system. Hit the Advanced, and this is the Advanced is where you're going to go in and choose the location of where that index will be stored, and uh, the, the file types as well. So in this case here, you see that I found my solar drawing file, and I want to say, hey, this is going to not only index the properties here, but also index the file contents inside the file itself. So again, uh, the indexing service here is not even supported, so I'm not really sure why PDM has this here, because you can't index a, a, another server somewhere else, so it has to be a, a current machine, and as we all know, PDM doesn't support Windows uh, 7 anymore, or 2008 R2. But uh, they've kept it there for some reason to keep it practical. Lots of good resources out there. Uh, the, the, certainly, the installation guide talks about the, uh, building this up in the administration guide as well. A couple last little points to the index itself. So just out of the box, if you just turn it on, that's going to start supporting all your Office documents, HTML files, the, the, the MIME. These are the attachments inside of uh, emails and just regular plain text. And they can be searched inside a file, inside a gzip file. Um, the tip that I showed you there, that does mean we need to have an OCR. That's not out of the box, but there are, uh, you can go to the Microsoft web page and download, uh, search for iFilters. And uh, there's a lot of different ones there. And different ones work different ways. Um, kind of depending, I recommend just trying different types of filters because if one tip filter doesn't OCR your files right, maybe another one does. I've seen some really good ones that uh, they scan in a bunch of old drawings that were handwritten, and uh, the OCR was able to pick up the, uh, the handwritten. Now, these were, you know, where they use engineering text, and the guys really wrote really nice and neat, but it did pick up on that. So if you download one OCR reader and you're not very happy with it, there's a bunch of others out there. Try a different one 
so you get ones that can pick up the uh, the kind of things you're looking for there. Um, the, the PDF filter, that's a third party one I downloaded from Adobe. The DWG one I downloaded from, I don't think I got it from Autodesk. I can't remember. It's been so long since I've downloaded that one. So there's lots of other ones out there. Most of them are free, but certainly my, again, depends on what you're looking for. The, the, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of, there's several free PDF ones, but really the really good ones are you have to buy. Kind of depends on what you want to do. If ever you do change and add more iFilters into your system, really all you need to do is just install it and then just restart your index and it will start using those as well. The last point kind of be aware of, you cannot download a SOLIDWORKS iFilter separately. And it can only be installed when you install SOLIDWORKS. And so if you intend to index SOLIDWORKS documents, and why wouldn't you, and your SOLIDWORKS documents are 2014 or newer, then you will need to install SOLIDWORKS on, your, uh, on the actual server. Now, you don't need to activate it. You don't even need to, uh, to have, it, have a license or anything. So um, you can just install it and never run it. And, and that, that's enough. But uh, you do have to make sure that you install it on your server. Um, another good point is that Windows Search does not support the indexing network drives or UNC path. You can only search that local drive. Um, now, I can't actually store the index itself on a drive somewhere else. But um, you, you can't index an external drive. So in short, you're going to have to run these Windows Search on the archive server. You're going to be able to go through there. And if you have multiple archive servers, you probably want to run run it on the one that, that's going to have the most number of files on there. So if you do have some files that are never replicated to that server, then the content search isn't going to be able to find them. Uh, the index can be big, but but it can also be small. Kind of depends on the kind of stuff you're in, in uh, indexing. Uh, I had I actually tech support one time. I asked them, and they usually said, usually figure out figure out what the about a, what your entire vault size is, and then figure about a third of it. Take that for what it's worth. But I've seen some indexes be a lot bigger, a lot smaller. So kind of be aware of that. So yeah, if uh, if it recognizes a big CPU command, you'll you'll see the uh, it tells you while it's indexing. I see this the server still indexing, and then if ever your machine is being really busy, it's just gonna say, well, wait a minute, I'm uh, not currently indexing. So this is kind of a fun one. Um, what, what this is, is uh, I, wanted, I wrote, had somebody ask on the, the SolarWorks forums, saying, is there any way to do a command line search? And um, so I wrote one, I'll show you what it looks like. I just, I wanna run it first and then you see how it kind of works. So a quick way to get to the command line, there's lots of ways I can open a command line, but I usually just do a, a Windows R, I bring it to the command line. And then I wrote a program called PDM Find, and then in this case, I'm going to search for a bracket and go ahead and click OK. And uh, it's going to basically find the bracket for me, find the first instance of the bracket that I, I have, and it's going to open that file for me and highlight it. And yep, here's that bracket. So it's kind of a mostly a fun little thing, but I, I mean, it's certainly first thing in the morning, if you know the name you're looking for here, this might be just a quick way to, to log into the vault and build things up as you might need to. The, uh, here's the code behind it. So it's just a, just a VB script. There's not anything special to it. If you're interested in, in downloading this, um, if you do a Google search for PDM search from the command line, it's a, the blog entry that's back on uh, on the January 29th, actually the 22nd, isn't it? Uh, real quick, kind of stepping you through this to get an idea of what we're doing here is we're basically I'm just saying, hey, what vault are we going to search on? We're going to create the vault object. Then we're going to log into the vault name. So whatever I type in here is the vault I'm going to log in. And then if I've been able to successfully log in, we're going to create a search object. I'm going to tell it, hey, let's look for folders. Uh, no, but let's look for files, yes. And let's for anything with a file name. So you notice here I'm not adding any wildcard, because remember I added the wildcard. And I kind of debated. You can really, however you want to write it, you can then maybe have it add the wildcard at the end if you want to. And then just basically, hey, uh, run, give me the very first file that you find. And whatever first file I find, then I'm going to go ahead and run a uh, Conicio script to, to open up that file. So you're welcome to it. It's something free you can download. If you think it's kind of fun, kind of fun to play with, and I kind of step you through all the steps it takes to, to build this up if you're interested in trying it. All right. So we talked a lot about stuff. We're, we're head wrapping stuff up. How do I decide which tool I want to use? And I always tell people, if you can get by the Windows Explorer search, do it. It's very fast. Um, you can then, you know, once you find that file, you can just double click on it and use it. 
right mouse click open or drag and drop into your application. You really can't go wrong with it. Uh, it's a very fast way to go thing. The search tool, I, I'll tell people really, if you ever need to search in multiple vaults, well, that might make sense. Certainly, if you're going to do a bunch of files, maybe I'm looking for 100,000 files and I need to check them all out or some crazy weird thing like that, then the search tool is definitely your tool to go because it doesn't have the overhead that Windows Explorer has. And then this is, the search tool is still the only place where you can go and edit search favorites. You got a lot of search favorites, you want to remove them, that's this is where you're going to go. Report generator um, really is, is the place that you want to do types of, like you saw, like I can do sums or you can do calculations or averages. Now, may, let's imagine that I have a particular assembly and I've been doing cost. I want to have it add up the entire cost of all that kind of thing. That's not something the search can do, right? But uh, the report generator can do different types of uh, averages and things for you that might have some value to it as well. So if you ever need to do any groupings, like group by, uh, show me all the files that Timmy made last year, group by month. So it's so you know, his Januarys and Februarys and March have been built all this thing up. Also, report generator does have the ability to query external databases. So maybe, let's go back to that cost example. Let's, let's imagine the cost information is stored in an ERP system. And I need to get the files from the PDM, but the cost from the ERP system. Report generator can uh, connect to other systems too, if you want to build those up. So not only can it search across multiple vaults, but it can also search across multiple databases too, which can sometimes be really handy if I need to get data from many different places. And then of course the command line is just something fun where I want to get the file, get, get, just give me the first hit that I get, give it to me now, and off I can run uh, to build those guys up. <laughs>